Welcome everybody, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for our special presentation today on creating a gallery quality print. We've got a special guest with us today and I'll bring him out into the set in just a second. I'm your host, Joe Brady, and I just wanted to go over a little bit of mechanics first. First of all, we are broadcasting live video. Sometimes that can present challenges for some of you depending on the bandwidth that you've got. So no worries, just in case you can't keep up or the sound won't sync with the screen, we are recording this and it will be downloadable for you. Now, I'd like to introduce first though, our special guest. We have Eddie Tapp with us here today. He's a gifted photographer and artist. He's a phenomenal educator. I've had the pleasure of, of working with him and watching Eddie work. And he's taught digital seminars on imaging around the world. He's an expert on workflow, color management, and of course, Photoshop. And he also holds two of the highest honors in digital photography. One, Eddie is a member of the Photoshop Hall of Fame. And secondly, Eddie is also a Canon Explorer of Light. He's a tireless and patient teacher who willingly shares his talents and experience to help fellow photographers continue to improve their craft. He's always seeking out new knowledge and exploring new things, though he's in a bit of a rut when it comes to beer, so I'm working on that with him. <laughs> I'm honored to consider him both a mentor and a dear friend, so let's welcome Eddie to our set. Joe, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank Thanks you for here. coming up to spend the time with us today. It's great to be here. So let's just have a seat and relax. Yeah. So as we, as we talked about, what we're here today is to talk about producing a gallery quality print. And I know we discussed this, and what I wanted to ask you first is, what do you think are the aspects that make up a print of that level? Well, you have to have the color brilliance there. You have to have good D-max and excellent dynamic tonal value, tonal range, and sharpness. I mean, those are the elements that I think you really look for in a gallery quality print. So just D-Max, for those of you that maybe haven't heard that term before? Uh, well, my name is Max, so yes. I'm, I'm D-Max. No, it's really. <laughs> Max Edwin Tapp. So D-Max has to do with the, the black end of the spectral. And when you have a good D-Max in your print, you have a nice, rich, black uh, value, opposed to some muddy-looking Right. And maintaining detail as you get down to there. You're not, you're not going muddy when you do that. All right. Good detail in the blanks. So the, those are the technical issues. Now, how about the artistic issues that are going to make up this gallery quality print? Well, then you have your, your emotional impact that you look for. And, of course, every image has a different uh, element with it. But the three elements that really are strong for me are emotional impact, the composition of the image and naturally the light itself. Yeah, of course, the light. So we've got basically five areas to deal with today, uh, processes to get our gallery quality print, and the first one's going to be actually our image capture. Yes. How we deal with, uh, we're doing a portrait shoot for this, how we deal with our model, how we communicate, and how we get that emotion and composition. We had from a our fun subject. day of shooting. That was, it was a great day, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yes. After we've got our capture done, we have to make sure our hardware is in the right spot. So we're going to talk about monitor and printer calibration. Then, again, we have one of the masters of Photoshop here with us. We're going to explore some image editing, both in Photoshop, in the new public beta of CS6, right. and also in Lightroom. Then after we're done, we've got our images ready to go. Then we'll talk about printing. Oh, the most important aspect. Absolutely. We'll talk about some of the details and some of the tools we'll use for that. And then lastly, what do you do with the print when you're done? How is it going to be presented? Where is it going to be? How do we have to treat it to make sure that it's in its best possible place? So we're going to start with our portrait photo shoot, and we're going to discuss image capture. Now, what do you, what do you look for when you go into a shoot? Well, there's three things involved here. There's your subject, there's a background, and the light. So I want to put those three things together. And as I'm composing the image with the subject, if the background isn't working, I try to make that work. But, you know, the shoot we had this day, everything was working. We had a beautiful model, Hope. We had our background was nailed down, and we had the best lighting you could possibly imagine. Plus, when we went into the warehouse, there was light waiting on us. Wasn't that exciting? That was amazing. Uh, we actually had to change our location for our planned shoot right at the last second and ended up in 
Actually, the Mac Group's abandoned warehouse, not abandoned, but we moved into a new facility, and the other building was still available. We ended up going out and shooting in there. And it was just one of those serendipitous moments. The light that was in there, we couldn't have asked for better. It was no. absolutely amazing. So we're going to deal into this a uh, little more detail later, but I did create an overview kind of of our shoot for the day. Oh, good. So let's just take a look, and this is just a short snippets of our video shoot of the portrait shoot for the day. Jump and twist. I want you to jump and twist towards the light. So I want that hair flying. Yes, good, good, okay. As a reference, now unlike Eddie, I need a light meter to actually figure out what my meter reading is. So I'm going to use... Now, sonic. wait, wait just a minute. I'm a light meter guy. He's a light meter guy, too, but I'm saying I don't have his bionic eyes that I can actually get a reading to read out inside my glasses. <laughs> so I'm just going to actually take a meter reading, and I'm getting... Feel it. Give me the feeling. Love it. Lo ooh, gorgeous wind. I was going to say, what... Yeah, I feel like you're standing at the front of the boat. Doing... <laughs> You have an absolutely beautiful smile. Give me that beautiful smile. Gorgeous, yes. Good air. Good wind. Beautiful. Mmm. Very heavy. Very good. Okay, nice. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Turn your nose this way for me just a touch. And can you pull your hair behind your ear? There you go. Now bring your nose back this way. That's the background. And the power set to 5.5. It's about half. And at about five and a half feet, we have the beauty dish still with the diffuser on it, coming in at an angle. And the power of it is about 6.5. It's got to stop brighter. But when we shoot the image, the background that looks like it's going to be all wrinkly is going to be nice and beautiful and it's just a gorgeous white background. And the light, hope, oh, you're giving those beautiful eyes right there. It's gorgeous. The light is... Would you like you to rub your back? <laughs> well, now that you mentioned it. <laughs> hope, turn your nose to the light. The man is in the beer rug. I'm sorry to say. Oh, wait a minute. We're on camera. <laughs> Put something beautiful in front of you. <laughs> All right, as you can see, we had a lot of fun that day. Oh, we had a blast. Yeah, it was, it was that great. was just little snippets of it. And actually, I was reminded uh, when I saw the logo come up, uh, I was remiss in, first of all, thanking our sponsors yes, for being please. here. Uh, Ilford Paper, which we're going to talk about in some detail, detail in a little bit. Uh, X-Rite for the color workflow, which we're also going to explore, and uh, we also had some help for some other folks. We had uh, Nick Software, who, who gave us some filters, and also um, Triple Scoop Music. And also um, Tiffin? Had Tiffin had some filters as well, so very good. So, Eddie, when you go into a portrait shoot, yes. what's your thought process when you're starting? Well, I think about those three things, the light, the background, the subject. And... The first thing I want to do is, is get that set up, and then, then it's the mood, the expression, it's the entire feeling that I want to get from that. But the light, of course, is the primary thing, light composition. So we, were, we lucked out onto our light. We both walked into the warehouse and saw ah. this light, and it was like, oh, we have to shoot that. It was beautiful. <laughs> However, that isn't always the case. No, it isn't. Uh, so also during our course of shooting that day, we also went into a small studio yes. and set up there. So do you approach ambient light shooting and studio lighting differently? In a sense, I, when there's ambient light or when there's natural light to work with, of course, I try to take advantage of where the best quality of that light exists. And in the studio, we have the ability to create the best light. So. That was uh, our, our objective that day, was working in natural light and in the studio light. So for those folks that aren't used to studio lighting, when you go into a studio, um, how do you start when you're dealing with a studio light? What's your process there? 
once I have the subjects set up and the background established, it's then setting the light to create the mood. So you're starting with one main light? First? I start with one light. Okay. And once I have that set up, if it needs accessory lighting, such as a background light or what I call a taste light, then we'll set that up. But it's one light is my main thrust. Now, when I've always done portraits in the past, my favorite light, almost exclusively, was a big softbox. Mm -hmm. And what Eddie kind of turned me on to when we did this portrait shoot was, uh, Eddie's a big fan of beauty dishes. Yes, and I in am. In fact, he's got one over here. Let's As a matter a of it. fact, I just happen to have one with me. <laughs> he always carries <laughs> this beauty dish around with him. And the beauty dish just gives a superb quality of light, both in sharpness and in softness, believe it or not. And I have the ability to put a, a honeycomb grid in here. But what we did this shoot day... Honeycomb yes, grid, there he is. That, I'm looking much better, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> but we actually did use this at the end of the day. But what we did use is a sock. We put a sock around the light to get just that little more uh, level of softness with this beauty dish. And the beauty dish is so beautiful. The spread of light is even. And it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous light. Just to clarify, for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to use a beauty dish before, think of three different extremes of lighting, where one extreme would just be a bare flash. You've got right. no light modifiers at all. And what you end up having is extremely a, hard extreme shadow. Extreme hard shadows, extreme, the, the transition from light to dark is very harsh. Right. And the contrast ratio is very harsh. The other extreme, we've got a big soft box. So it's creating that nice wrap and a very gentle gradation from light to dark, the beauty dish kind of sits somewhere in between there. It does. So the, actually, it doesn't make sense when you think about it until you've actually used one, but it is both sharp and soft at the same time. Mm -hmm. It creates a little bit more of contrast than a soft box does, but still a nice smooth gradation from light to dark. And, you know, and take this anywhere, any location, and shoot with great confidence and get great light right off the bat. I'll oh, before we light. forget. What's the other, one other thing that, again, Eddie really turned me on to using these beauty dishes is what does it do for the catch lights? Ooh, the catch light, it just gives you a perfect circle in the catch light. It's really, really It really cool. creates a little beautiful circle in the light. Uh, so also, when we were in the studio, we shot tethered. We did. So actually, let's take a walk right over here and awesome. take a look at something. Again, a couple of tools that will make your shooting easier. And what Eddie and I were doing was Shoot, we were both shooting Canon cameras, but tethered directly into Lightroom. And the beauty of that was, well, we created a custom profile with the passport, the color checker passport from X-Rite. In fact, let's get that. And that allowed, between that, between the color checker and being able to do a custom white balance and applying the lens profile in Lightroom, our images snapped into place as far as color right away. So we got to see that image on the screen immediately. But we, we also made a perfect exposure because you took... A reader meeting. A reader meeting. <laughs> a reader meeting. <laughs> reader meeting. That's an Eddieism. That's an Eddieism. Okay. Uh, yes, we did use a handheld meter, as you actually um, uh, are going to see. Actually, you saw during the shoot that I was using the meter, and yes, Eddie oh, uses right. a meter too. Yes, I'll do a close-up. We actually up talked in a about that. So, a couple of tools that make that a lot easier to do. Uh, we got a couple of tools here from one of our favorite accessory companies called Tether Tools, and. Great, great stuff. Brilliant. Who would have thought an orange cable? How many times can't you find a black cable because it's sitting in your bag or someone trips over it because it's on a dark floor next to power cables? And this one little bit of brilliance, this thing's called a jerk stopper. And what it does is it holds the cable in the camera because this is one of the parts that you could easily damage uh, if this gets yanked out. So this keeps it in place. Or you could run a file mm -hmm. that you're shooting too. That's true. If you can right in the middle of a shoot, a guy gets pulled out, you're done. And then also, we have this great table that just fits on a light stand Brilliant. that keeps our computer in place. Projector. And, or projector. And then for Eddie, very important, I have my Dunkin' Donuts cup here, but Eddie can put his IPAs right in here, <laughs> so you've always got your, your cup ready to go. Very important. That's, of course it's very important. So, we've, we saw kind of our overview of the photo shoot. Yes. And, well, actually, we'll talk about our final prints so that you can see behind us in a little bit. But let's take a look at the results we both got right out of camera. Now, these are not edited. And one thing I'll, I'll ask you to take a look at, even though Eddie and I were shooting the same exact model, mm -hmm. what ended up happening? We both got totally, completely different results. What you were shooting, I was so impressed with because I was standing right next to you, but I'm like, 
How did you see that? How did you get that? And I shot something completely different, different mood, feeling, and composition. And same thing, I'm watching Eddie, and I said, wow, I would have never thought of doing that. So if you haven't done that before, that's one of the greatest things you can do, and that's shoot with someone else. Because you, you learn from each other, and you see, and you can learn from everybody. That's right, even our you students know, we learn from. Yeah, not even frequently. <laughs> we learn the most from our <laughs> students because they ask questions that maybe we had forgotten about even thinking That's about. That's so true. Yeah. So let's take a look at our photo shoot. Do take a notice. And also, as the course of the day went on, we talked about this earlier, our images started to get a little closer in mood, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not. We started off it's very apart, thing. very different moods. Yes. And then as the day went on from us watching each other, we kind of started ending up in the same place, with one exception. When we went back into the warehouse, Eddie found a couple of old fluorescent tubes yes, that, that he put fun. to remarkable use. So take a look. All right, so that was just a little small sampling, and it was interesting, the, the difference that we saw. What a uh, fun day. When I went into that warehouse, I was seeing kind of the grunge, and he, although Hope was a very upbeat person, yes. uh, I just kind of saw a more brooding uh, sense in that environment where Eddie had her skipping and jumping, which was interesting in contrast to the environment, yeah. and actually it was in some ways it was more powerful, so it was really fun to watch. Creating art. And that was just a small sampling we shot. I think between the two of us, there were five or 600 At images least. for the day. Yeah. So, which brings up another question. We've got these hundreds of images. What is your processing for editing that down? Ooh, well, the first thing I want to do is find images that I'll show you, the images that will be on the board. So, of all the images, I'll take uh, Lightroom, and I'll put my left hand on the 1-2 key, and the right hand on the left right arrow key, and I'll start going through the images as quickly as possible. And if I see any image that I'll present to anyone, it'll get a one-star rating. If I happen to see an image that I really like, I'll go ahead and give it a two-star rating and get through that initial edit as quickly as possible. Then I'll go back and look through the number twos. 
and I'll start to choose my favorites, the winning images, the ones that I'll actually take in the process. So out of 600 images, I think I chose about 12 images that I wanted to process. Uh, I, I, I'm not in real life a hoarder, uh, but I know that sometimes I have a tendency with my files, and I'm sure many of you do as well. You just can't throw things out. You're afraid, wow, there was a great ear in that picture, although the rest of it was completely a waste. So That's a good reason to keep an ear picture. Ear picture, well, if you're into <laughs> ears, fine. But uh, So let them go. You know, do that initial edit because it's going to make it easy for both you and for your client to decide what it is that they really need to see. Well, out of that entire session, I'll have X images that I've typed the X key. Those are going to be thrown away and empty. The trash can will be empty. I'm not going to manage those files. There'll be another set of images of ears that <laughs> won't get rated, but I will keep those for later use. All right. So we've got our winnowing down, in essence. We've taken these hundreds of images and got it down to a little more manageable size. But before any of the editing can take place, it's really vital to make sure that the hardware that we're going to be doing the processing on has been calibrated and profiled. Critical. Now, we're using the new i1 Pro 2 from X-Rite. Uh, in fact, Jen, if you would just show uh, a big image of that, I just want to show you guys up close. This is a brand new device, and this is a color management system that allows us to profile both our monitors and digital projectors. But on top of that, we can create custom printer profiles for our printers and the above and beyond part, it even lets us, lets us adjust profiles to a specific light source, which is important for this gallery mounted print because we need to know what kind of light is going to be illuminating the print. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about this today, but we are going to see an overview. But a first, a few questions for Eddie. So Eddie, why, why do we need to pro monitor profile? Well, in any digital workflow, we want two things to take place. We want to get predictable results, and we want to have consistency. So the only way to have consistency is to make sure that your equipment is properly calibrated, and there's an adjective for you, properly. So having proper calibrated equipment ensures consistency in the process. And if we don't do this? If you don't do that, you may end up with the bad results when you get to your final output. I hear this from a lot of my photographer friends. They send out stuff to the lab, comes back dark, comes back yellow, and the fault really in 99.9% .9 of the cases is it's not the lab's fault. It, that is correct. It is, uh, it is our fault. We're not <laughs> properly calibrating our display. Yeah, you got to have that monitor under control. Now, the other part of it was actually creating a custom profile for the paper. Now, there's all we can download profiles for our papers from the manufacturer, but why go through the process of creating a custom profile? Well, the, the profiles that we use with the Elford paper from Elford that we can download are wonderful profiles to use. However, creating your own custom profile will, will take into consideration many uh, idiosyncrasies such as the altitude we might be at or the, the temperature or humidity, the environment. There's a lot of things that can add up to getting that extra mile with your profile. I like that. Extra mile extra. with your profile. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually experienced that myself live. I was doing a workshop out in Colorado Springs, and I brought my profiles with my printer, and when I went to print, the results were off. And the reason was I was at very dry air, 7,000 feet, and it changes the pressure inside the ink cartridges, and the wow. amount of ink that comes out is different, so I actually had to reprofile while I was there. And really, when you do create a custom profile, what ends up happening is you have an exact snapshot of how your printer puts down ink and produces color on that paper. It's not an average as a downloadable profile has to be. Just by definition, you've got an exact picture of yours. So again, we're going to present a, a session just on the i1 Pro 2 and its details. But let's do a really quick, less than two minute overview of monitor and paper profiling. Perfect. All right, this is just meant as a quick overview of the i1 Pro 2 device and the new i1 Profiler software. Now, on Monday, May 14th, there will be a detailed introduction to the i1 Pro 2, which will dig down through all the intricacies of the system and the software, and you get to see all the benefits that it offers. 
So I've got the hardware here, and place it on the screen, and then let the software do its thing. It will completely take over the computer and the monitor and make all the adjustments necessary. All the known value colors are flashed up on the screen. Now this is sped up greatly just to keep this part short. Then the readings are compared to what is expected and a profile is created from that. The profile is then saved and it's automatically implemented. And then it's time to move on to profile in the printer. One of the beauties of i1 Profiler software is you can determine how many patches you want to send into your printer for profiling. And it can be quite a lot if you like. You can make that profile as exacting as you demand. Just make sure, as always, when sending out to the printer, that you turn off any color management in the printer driver. And then the software will send out your printed sheets with all the patches on it. And just using the board here, it's very simple to just line up the carrier and click and scan across with the i1 Pro 2. And you can go in either direction, it does recognize that. When it's done, save your profile and it's ready to be put to work. All right, so we got a couple of questions. Let's, uh, let's answer the couple of these first. Okay. And um, one question is that why would we want to use a, a, a meter reading? Or in your case, a reader meeting or whatever, <laughs> whatever it would be. I like reader meetings. <laughs> um, why is that important? Well, accuracy, consistency. I want to read the light that's coming on the subject and get an accurate exposure. And with all the varying factors we have today, with uh, reflectors and lighting and ISOs, and all, all the different aspects, to get an accurate reading of your subject matter to me is critical. Yeah, and that's the key. We need to know what the light is on our subject. And for example, when we were in that warehouse, it was very dark to very light. There was quite a contrast ratio. Right. So if we relied on the camera's meter, that's going to change depending on where the subject is framed in that very contrasty scene. By using a light meter, actually on the subject, we have a perfect exposure for our subject and we can let everything else fall into place. It's actually a little more complicated than that, uh, but that's basically what's going to go on. When you, can, when you can get an accurate exposure to start with, then that makes the rest of your workflow that much easier. Uh, another question is interesting, and this will come into our studio lighting, is what is the best way to get a really white background? Well, uh, I would start out with a, a really white background. <laughs> Silly. Profound. Sure. Uh, but I would change the exposure to maybe a stop and a half over the main light for the subject. And of course it depends on how you want to have your subject off the background a little bit because yes. if you overlight it you're going to get that kind of halo-y blowout around the side. Well, there's, there's a lot of varying factors here depending on if it's full length, what it is you're shooting. With the particular setup that we had, we had the light right behind Hope and, went, and metered that light one stop brighter than the main light. Right, and the important thing is to have enough light if you're dealing with a large white background to have more than one light because you need to evenly illuminate it. That's got to be even. So I, I can say for me, when I'm lighting a white background, I'm going to be, depending on the subject, if she's a blonde or has dark hair, somewhere between two-thirds of a stop and one and a half stops over whatever my main light is on the subject. That's kind of the rule of thumb I use. Uh, a couple of you are asking about specific light meters. Uh, we'll just, uh, we used on the set uh, Sekonic 358, kind of really one of the standards. Uh, if you want to really get into the spot metering, some people want to know exactly where the highlights sit, then you have to jump up to the Sekonic 758. Uh, Eddie, this is a good question for you. Do you have a favorite aperture? They ask, what aperture were you using when you're photographing Hope? You know, I, I do. I, I, I love shooting at f11. Okay. f11, there f it is. That's all you need to know. Uh, actually, you know, uh, one of the things about apertures that's important to know is you're going to need more aperture depending on how much of the frame your subject is filling. If you zoom in very close, you would think at f8, oh, I got plenty of aperture. I can be in focus from the nose to the ears. Probably not the case if you're up real close. Well, you always focus on the eyes, regardless. Of course. Your eyes need to be in focus, uh, barring anything else. Another question was, do we create a camera profile for every shoot? And the answer to that is no. You know, just a camera profile for a lighting environment is sufficient. If we're under tungsten lights, we create a profile for tungsten. If it's our studio lights, we'll create one for that. We don't need to create one each time. What you do need to do is white balance or have a white reference and white for every balance. shoot. And I tell you, it doesn't hurt when you're creating a custom profile for a job you might shooting, be shooting because the customer 
becomes impressed. My goodness, look at the care he's given to my image, my product, my shot. Okay. Uh, another question, just to address okay. this, um, somebody asked, uh, Mark F. asked, are we exposing to the right? Kind of another scientific thing. Um, we were more concerned about our subject. Uh, exposing to the right, really probably a subject for another day when we actually do one of our metering sessions. Uh, but in general, our biggest concern was making sure our, our subject was exposed correctly. You know, that's a great question. And when you expose to the right, that, that means the, um, the middle density of your image is being exposed to the right side of the histogram. That's what the question is about. And that's always good because there's actually more uh, information on that side of the histogram. As long as you don't climb up the histogram wall mm -hmm. on the right side, then, then that's good. Yeah. But it was a good answer, and yeah, that's we'll, another topic. We'll discuss that in, in more detail in future sessions. Now, as I mentioned, at the, this is a really fast overview of this process. We've already discussed we could probably do this for three days straight, eight hours a day. Uh, so each of these steps does, is going to need its own follow-up session. So again, next, a week from Monday on May 14th will be the first follow-up. Uh, Brenda Hipscher from x Right Photo is going to present the program on the i1 Pro 2 Perfect. and its wonderful software, i1 Profiler. So we'll send that in the email. So we've got our shoot. We've winnowed out our best shots. Now it's time for image processing. Yes. And we're dealing with both Lightroom and Photoshop. Uh, we've got our monitor profile, we've got our custom paper profile, and now we're ready to begin. So, Eddie, when you start to bring in your images into Photoshop or Lightroom, uh, is there, what is your process? What, how, how do you start? What is the first thing you take a look at? Well, the first thing that I want to check on is, of course, the color, the color balance, and change the white balance if necessary, and then the tonal values are the contrast ratio. So those are the two things that are up front, bar nothing else. Then comes the creative process, and whether that's uh, creating cookie lighting or enhancements using third-party filters, uh, that comes afterwards. But what I want to do is focus the viewer's attention to the mood, the feeling, the element that I want them to see first. I want to direct the eyes first. So, yeah. Now, of course, in my mind. we want to get as close as possible to a finished image in camera. We want to. We don't want to have to do major edits to fix problems. However, we were discussing earlier how uh, the limitations of our final output have to be adapted. We're capturing so much color. Yes. And then when we're outputting, it has to be brought down. And we were using Ansel Adams as, a, as an example right. for what was going on there. If you could just talk about that real quick. Well, of course, Ansel would uh, shoot film. And he would expose for the shadow region with the film and then process the film to get detail in the highlights. So he would basically take an enormous amount of dynamic range and compress it into the negative and then he would take that one step further in the dark room where he would actually print in a similar fashion to maintain detail throughout the, the print itself. So the other reason we have to do this is we want our images to kind of be presented the way we remember them with our own eyes and where our cameras maybe have six stops or a little bit more of tonal range from light to dark our eyes have what? 20 to 22 stops of tonal range when we process an image through our eyes. So we need to be able to translate that, plus the way that our eyes see contrast curve is different than our cameras, so that's where the editing comes in. Now, as many of you know, Eddie is a true master of Photoshop, and he's prepared a pair of demonstrations for us. And by the way, if you haven't seen it before, uh, this would be your first view of the new public beta release of uh, Photoshop CS6. Which is downloadable. Which is downloadable for free. So let's watch Eddie's first processing demonstration. Great, thank you. When you study with Joe, you know you're going to get a perfect exposure every single time. I love this image of Joe. I'll show you the treatment I gave to it in just a minute. First, let's take this image of Hope. We'll create a few enhancements here in Lightroom and then go into Photoshop for some final enhancements. I want to start out by zooming to 100% and just brighten up her eyes just a touch. We'll do that by using the adjustment brush and a plus exposure. I've got the auto mask feature set with the adjustment brush. We'll go ahead and just paint on her eyes here. 
and you can see I've got a blue color here. We'll remove that in just a moment. As a matter of fact, we'll go ahead and click on the color bar and take the hue and saturation to the bottom left hand corner. And let's take the brightness or the exposure to about 15%, 0.15, and that works really well for this. I'm going to create a new adjustment with a smaller brush. And I want to create a half moon kind of brush stroke here to create a little bit of a gleam at the bottom of the eye. And of course, I'll remove the color once again. The next thing I want to do is match the neck skin tone with the face skin tone. I think the difference here is the, the makeup itself, actually. So we'll, we'll go ahead and create a new adjustment. I have the auto mask feature still set on. Let's get a bigger brush here and just start painting right on the skin here. This is a, just a quick mask. And of course, I want to take the exposure to a minus exposure. And we'll click on the color. And somewhere between red and yellow is going to be a fairly decent match. We'll change the hue and saturation just by clicking and dragging around the box here. And that's a pretty decent match right there. We can work with that. We can change it if we need to later. But let's take a look at a before and after. And now you can see that there is a pretty decent change here. Let's now go into Photoshop. We're going to right click on the thumbnail and select Edit In and Edit in Photoshop. I'm going to use a smart object. So I'm going to open the image as a smart object in Photoshop. And here's the treatment I gave to Joe with this particular image. Just putting him on a new background. And here we go. Let's take this image. I want to do a couple of things here. There's three things I want to do here, actually. The first is to use a third-party plug-in filter. And this would be Tiffin's DFX filter. Doing this, I want to use the diffusion effect. And for this filter, I've selected HFX Diffusion and the Diffusion FX. And in the presets, just selecting the one that gives the best skin tone treatment for this particular image. This looks very decent. Let's go ahead and process this image, this filter. And because this is on a smart object, the filter comes with a mask. It's a smart filter now, so there is a mask here. And with the mask, we'll take the brush tool. Let's go up to 100%. And with the brush tool, I'm going to paint over areas at about 80% opacity and bring back uh, details in the lips and a little bit under the nostrils here and the eyes and the eyebrows. And of course, we want to do this. We want to keep the skin tone very soft. It's a beautiful skin tone treatment. And any other areas that we want to bring back through uh, the skin tone treatment. The next thing I want to do with this particular enhancement is to create what I call the dream glow. It's the technique I've been using and teaching for many years. Let's go to the channels panel. And we can select any one of these channels, but I'm going to select the green channel. Select all edit copy and then in the layers panel I'm going to create a blank layer and then go to edit paste and now that we've pasted the green channel on a layer by itself the next step is to change the blending mode from normal to luminosity at about 25 percent opacity somewhere in there and then we can run a, a filter such as the Gaussian Blur filter. Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. About 20 pixels is going to do fine here. Right after running this filter, we'll go to Image Adjustments and choose Curves. And here we'll add a little punch to this by going to the preset Strong Contrast. To finish this part up, we'll go ahead and click on the Add Layer Mask icon. And then with the Brush Tool, paint over the eyes and eyebrows, just like we did a moment ago. Lips and nostrils. 
And the variable factor here happens to be the opacity settings. So you can change the opacity to get a different look. But the combination of using the Dream Glow and the Diffusion Filter with the Tiffin DFX Filter is a beautiful effect with this image. This is before any filters. This is adding the Skin Tone Diffusion and the Dream Glow effect. And to finish this image, I want to create just what I call Cookie Light. And to do that, we'll create one more adjustment layer using Curves. And in the Curves dialog box, we're going to take the highlight point and bring it straight down along the wall, opposed to creating a curve. We'll just bring the density down a little more than halfway. And now with the Brush Tool and Black Paint, let's do this at 100% opacity. Then we can just start to paint right on the image to create a lighting effect. I just want to get just a little bit of lighting, a spotlighting look here. And now you can see the effects of this lighting effect before and after. And this is the enhanced version of this image. All right, we're back live. So first thing I do need to say is that despite this man's absolute prowess in Photoshop, he still couldn't make me look good, even if he stuck me in Hawaii. So <laughs> I'm also going to, I'm going to get him back for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I thought you looked great in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, I, I wish I was there now. So anyway, we saw you using Photoshop CS6. And by the way, if you see it's a, they had a gray background on that. That's actually the new default. But if that drives you nuts and you're not a Lightroom person and you want your Photoshop to look the way it always did, yep. you can tell it. So you've been working with Photoshop CS6 for a little bit. What's your impressions of the new upgrade? Well, that and Lightroom 4 have been built from the ground up. The new processing algorithms are phenomenal in every aspect. So the new features in Photoshop CS6 are phenomenal, but the speed and processing uh, engine are just fantastic. One of the things that used to drive me nuts um, is when you brought an image from Lightroom into Photoshop, you'd get a little bit of a difference because they were using a different processing engine. You won't see that again. Finally. Yes, the brilliance of processing in Lightroom and opening that up and seeing exactly what you processed in CS6 is beautiful. It's a beautiful experience. So the, the wonderful thing is now Lightroom 4 and Photoshop CS6 will both be using the same Adobe Camera Raw processing and the same processing engine. So that's a beautiful thing. Uh, before we look at Eddie's second demonstration, just a couple of questions. Um, oh, somebody asked, is there a discount on the Color Checker Passport? Yes. So when we send our follow-up email, we'll send you any kind of coupons or rebates that are going on. So we'll include that uh, later, or actually sometime tomorrow that will go out. Uh, also, here's a good question, and there's a lot of confusion about this. In your camera, I assume that's what you're asking, do you have your color space set to Adobe RGB or sRGB? Well, um, because I'm shooting RAW, there is no color space embedded in the file when you shoot RAW. So if you're shooting JPEG, you know, depending on your workflow, you want sRGB or Adobe RGB for specific reasons. But um, if you're shooting RAW, there is no color space until you get to the process right. and, and process your image into an output. That's file. something that has a lot of folks confused. When you have that color space choice actually in your camera, that only applies to JPEGs. It's got nothing to do with your raw capture. It's just there for you JPEG folks. Uh, so don't worry. When you bring your file into Lightroom or Photoshop, there is no color space assigned yet. You have to tell it what do you want to process it as. That's right. Well, you're talking about when you're in Photoshop, you're in a color space. Well, I'm the Adobe Camera Raw. That Adobe space. Camera Raw, or the bridge, if you will, in Lightroom. Lightroom actually uh, will default color space for editing is Profoto RGB. So it's going to stay there until that color space then gets built into the file when you actually export, export it. Export it, right. Good. Perfect. Uh, another question was, uh, I guess for either of us, I'll ask it to, to you, Eddie. Uh, do you use a Wacom tablet, a mouse, or a trackpad for your brushwork? Wacom tablet every single day, all day long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that was pretty definitive. I, I use a Wacom tablet also. Uh, but, you know, we both travel a lot also. Yes. Uh, I will even use my trackpad for edits because if I'm on a plane, that's all I got with me. So... 
Carpal yeah. tunnel. Uh, yeah, well, I will do that. Okay, uh, so one more image edit from Eddie. Uh, in fact, I believe in this one, you know, get to see some of the edits you used when, we, when you found those old dead fluorescent tubes, what you did to the image. So it let's watch fine. that. Yes, this is great. What a fun image to end the day with. This was the last shot of the day as we found these fluorescent tubes in the warehouse. And the lighting was coming in the window of the warehouse. And the backlight was the beauty dish with a grid creating the outline. Processing this image is going to be pretty simple. We're just going to take the exposure and look at the highlight shadows, whites, and blacks and create any adjustments that might enhance the image. Not a whole lot needs to be done here. The lighting was just right on target. I do want to take the adjustment brush and with a minus exposure, let's get a bigger brush here. We'll add some detail in the white t-shirt and maybe the legs and pants keep the focus, lighting focus on the beautiful face of Hope. I'll create one more adjustment here, a little less exposure for her left arm. That looks very nice. Next, by right-clicking on the thumbnail icon, we'll take this into Photoshop. I'll take it in as a smart object, as I usually do, to create the glow and, and black background. I like using smart objects because it allows me to go back in to the original RAW file. By double-clicking on the thumbnail icon in the layer panel, it'll take the image right into Adobe Camera Raw. But notice the adjustments we made in Lightroom are exactly the same here. Even in the adjustment brush, the adjustments we just made in Lightroom are still here. And that's what I want to do with this image, is just create a brighter face for Hope. And that looks very nice right there. Let's go ahead and select OK. And to create the dark background, all we're going to do is take the Quick Selection tool and create a quick selection of the background on both sides. And notice where the selection kind of over-selected some regions. If you hold down the Option key, which is Alt key on Windows, with the Quick Selection tool, we'll go ahead and select those regions, and they'll subtract from the current selection. Now we can create an adjustment layer using Exposure. And here I'll take the Gamma Correction slider to the right and create a nice, dark, rich background. You can see there's, I don't think anything is showing, so it worked out very nicely. And before we create the glow, I want to correct whatever these artifacts are on the image right here. Let's zoom in a little bit over here. I'll take the Lasso tool. And from the Freeform Lasso tool, once you start using it, you can then hold down the Option key, which is Alt key on Windows, and it temporarily turns the Lasso tool into the Polygon Lasso tool. So then just by clicking, uh, you can create straight lines. And I'll use this to create a quick selection of these regions to clean this up pretty quickly. And because we're working on a layer that has a smart object. We can't do any real retouching here. We'll have to create a blank layer. Now I'll take the clone stamp tool and just clone out these areas that are right up against the selection. And that should be a nice clean finish there. Finally, we're going to merge these layers into a pixel layer. Command Option Shift E or Control Alt Shift E on Windows. Well, create a merged layer for us. Now all the layers below have been merged to one layer. And we'll go back to the Quick Selection tool. And let's create a, a selection of the tubes. And now that we have this selected, I'm going to refine this one more time with the Lasso tool. Holding down the Option or Alt key, I'm just going to create a minus selection right on the tips of these fluorescent tubes because we don't need these to glow. We just want the light itself to glow. Now I want to jump this selection to a layer command or control J for jumping. And you can see what I've jumped. I've just selected the tubes, jump those to a layer. And there's two things we're going to do here to refine this. One is to change the blending mode from normal to screen. And you can see it brightens up the image already or the the glow of the, the lights. 
And we'll also add a blur. Let's go to Gaussian Blur under Filter. Blur and use the Gaussian Blur filter. I've got it set to about 30 pixels. That looks pretty good. And let's jump this layer once again. Command or Control J. And watch what happens. It just doubles the effect. And what if we did that once again? It would double the effect again. So that might be a little too much. I am going to go back and create one more selection. And because we've already selected the layer with the, the tubes, all you have to do is hold down the Command key or Control key on Windows. And then with your cursor right over the thumbnail, just click once. That will give an active selection to this area. And now we'll go back to the Exposure Adjustment layer. And let's take the gamma slider once again to the right. I'm just trying to add a little extra detail back into the tubes themselves. Let's see if that worked. That looks pretty decent. Okay, and this was the final image of the day, and it was just a lot of fun to work with. All right. By the way, Eddie, some amazing demonstrations. Thank you. And a couple of you folks were, were asking about uh, that we're a little bit Photoshop heavy in layers and things like that, but the whole processing and the editing of the image is probably one of the most major parts of creating the gallery quality print. Absolutely. Uh, we've got to get that under control. So that is something that really actually needs to be delved into some more. Uh, there was an interesting question about how to profile for a metal print. Yes. Uh, and I have, I've, done, I've done a couple with uh, my lab. Two ways to do it. Uh, as we were just talking about, a metal print, something I assume your lab is going to be printing, not you. I don't know. I've never tried to print a metal print on my own printer. Probably somebody makes materials for that. But you're going to send them an sRGB file to your lab. And that's what they're going to use to do the printing process. And if you send them a calibrated file, if you know that that image on your screen is correct, when you then send it to your lab, they have very sophisticated software. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take your file, your properly edited file on your calibrated system, and it's going to convert it into the color space of whatever material they're printing on. All right. They know how to do that. They're very good at that. And, and whenever I send out to a lab, whether it's metal, canvas, a book, gloss, or matte, as long as I'm giving them a properly calibrated file, I get results that look back. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to actually profile, have a specific profile from a lab for that, with the i1 Pro 2, you can actually send them the targets. You have can actually them have them print them out on any material you want, and you can bring it and read it back in and create your own custom profile. Uh, is that necessary? Not sure, because the, so the softwares that drive those printers are pretty sophisticated. But if you want to take it to that level, you absolutely can. You can actually send out these targets to your lab, ask them to print them on the material, send it back to you, and you can create your own custom profile for the lab. So, yeah, that is an option. Um, there was another, just to clarify again, there's still a little bit of confusion about the sRGB, Adobe RGB thing. So, Eddie, just clarify again when you're shooting raw and what's going on on the LCD on the back of the camera. Well, the LCD is going to show you an sRGB color space, so you're not going to see the raw, if you're shooting raw, you're not going to see all that chrominance data or luminous data. However, the histogram is also kind of an sRGB histogram. So you look at that, you, we get to a point where we want to really learn the characteristics of the tools we're working with. And I'm sure we're all familiar with looking at an image on the back of the camera and getting it in process and say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like it did there. So we have to learn what we're looking at and how we're seeing it and how it really is going to react. And you know, the histogram really becomes our friend for that. But as far as the color space is concerned, where we don't have a color space embedded in the files we're shooting if we're shooting RAW. If you're shooting JPEG, it's going to either be sRGB or Adobe RGB. And that setting is totally dependent on what you're shooting JPEG for. All right. So uh, going again, one last thing about color space is because someone may ask, do you use ProPhoto to process and print from Photoshop? And when you're going to send a file out to somewhere else, what happens to it? Well, nothing leaves my computer ever unless it's in sRGB. However, all of my images are processed in ProPhoto RGB. So I process in the largest color space and output those to send out to labs 
are to clients in sRGB only. That's, uh, that's unless I'm sending it to Joe, and I'll send you my files in ProPhoto RGB. So again, understand that uh, when he's talking about sRGB, yes, it's a smaller color space. But like it or not, all those lab printers that we're sending out to have our prints made on, that's the color space they work in. So that's the, the shape color of the space world. they work So fine. until that changes, fine. And by the way, you don't want to upload any image to the Internet unless it's in sRGB. Yes, because that's what the Internet's designed around, sRGB. Um, now, one other question. By the way, again, it is... Uh, well, we're getting close to our hour, but yes. we probably still have another f 10 to 15 minutes okay, to so. go. So we're going to go over a little bit. Uh, we're going to kind of cut back on the questions right now. When we're done, we will come back at the very end for any of you guys that want to continue to ask questions. But let's, yes. let's get things close to finish up. Perfect. One more edit. Uh, again, and this is important because not all of you are Photoshop folks. So what I decided to do was I did my image edit exclusively in Lightroom. Never went into Photoshop for it. I did use the help of one little extra plugin. I used Nick Color Effects Pro to smooth some of the skin. Uh, but let's see one edit just in Lightroom, and then we'll come back and start to address the actual printing process and what to do with our image after that. Awesome. So take a look. Great. So I'm going to bring the whites down because it's not, it's not overexposed. If you look at the histogram, it's just fine. So you can see just by bringing the whites down here, you can see the before and after by bringing the whites down there. It just takes a little bit of the heat off of the white and makes it less of a focus. Now also I have my camera set fairly desaturated because I also use it for video so I'm going to add a little of saturation back in as well. Generally somewhere between 10 and 15 I find is about right for my camera and we're already well on our way. Just as we saw in Eddie's demo what I'm going to do is uh, approach the slight different color in her face because her face had makeup on and the neck and the top of her chest did not. I'm going to approach it slightly differently. I'm going to bring up the adjustment brush tool. I'm going to turn on the mask overlay right here so that I can see uh, where I'm painting. And I do have auto mask on and I have my flow turned down a little bit rather than 100%. So I'm just going to start painting in here so we can kind of see the effect. And the beauty of this tool, when you have the auto mask on, is you can go right up against other colors and it's not going to affect them. It's going to just mask around them automatically. Now, her hair color is actually very close to her skin. So it may pick up a little bit of it in here, but for what we're going to do in this piece, it doesn't really matter. I'm actually going to come up to something new that is in Lightroom 4 where I can adjust the color temperature. Uh, of an adjustment point. You can see that her face is a little more yellow because of the, the makeup. I'm going to make the neck and the rest of her the same. So I'm going to add a little bit of yellow just by dragging the temperature slider over. I'm also going to turn the exposure down a little bit because I, again I want to be a better match on her face. That quickly now we have all of the skin that is showing matching. Now I'm going to do the same thing kind of we did with her face that I did with her neck before. And my goal is a little different here. Let me go one to two. I'm going to use the adjustment brush again, turn on the overlay, and I'm going to paint around her face here. And what I'm going to do is actually do a little bit of softening using this brush. Turn off the mask so I can see again better. And what I'm going to do is turn down the clarity. So I'm going to bring this way down, and that has the effect of softening the skin. One of the things I really liked about that image is I had kind of, a, after I took it, a different idea of what the crop should be. So I'm going to click on the crop tool, and I really want to come in on her to something more like this. This is kind of more what I was after. And I'm also going to add a little bit more of an angle to her. So I'm going to rotate that around and position her right where I want. So I've got my rule of thirds grid right in there. I'm going to put that right near one of her eyes and hit done. And now we're getting a much more dramatic portrait. The last thing that's bugging me is the background. I mean, we've got sheetrock in this warehouse. It's okay. It's part of the scene, but I, wanted, I want to de-emphasize it. So once again, I'm going to bring up the adjustment brush. And I've got auto mask on again. This time I'm going to bring my flow up a little more. And I'm just going to turn on my overlay mask so I can see where I'm painting again. And I'm just going to start selecting this background outside of her. And again, it's okay if we get a little bit of her. 
because we can just hold down the option to get rid of that. Yeah, I picked up a little of her hair there, that's okay. All right, now what I'm going to do is do a, a brightness change here, an exposure change, so it's okay if a little bit of her is touched. So, okay, so we've got the background selected. Turn off the overlay, and now what I'm going to do is just bring down the exposure and the saturation of the background. In fact, I'll bring the clarity too. If there's anything in focus, I'll defocus that. And then hit done. Uh, an option that you can use, one of my favorite plugins is for portrait editing, is NYX Color Effects Pro. So I can go right in Lightroom to go to Color Effects Pro. And one of my favorite tools in here is uh, let's go, let's change our color space to Pro Photo and we'll edit it as a TIFF. Uh, one of my favorite filters in this particular software package is called Dynamic Skin Softener. All right, so here we have our image in Color Effects 4. Let's take a look at the filter list. First, I'm just going to go just to the Dynamic Skin Softener, and how that works is very simply. I just take the eyedropper, tell it what skin is, and I can tell it how much of a color reach I want it to affect. And since we pretty much softened her up, but you can see that the skin down here is softening. In fact, if we take, tell it that's the color we're after, in fact, let's zoom to 100%. And again, this area here, watch how nice a job it does it smoothing. You can see how much it smooths the skin, and it doesn't affect anything else. Now, another beauty of this software is you have now what are called recipes where you can combine filters. And I have a couple of that, a couple of them that I use, including this one, which is a combination of the skin softener and a polarizer. And the polarizer has the effect of adding a little bit more glow in, in both the skin and to the hair in this case. So you can see as I go back and forth here, let me just come up to her face a little more, and we'll see the highlights of her hair here as well. And you can see they get a little bit more glow color. It's just a nice effect. And I just hit save, and I'm done with my edit. So we went from here, this was our starting photograph, to here. Joe, I always learn from you. That was a great demonstration. And by the way, is that a polarizing filter you have in front of your face, or are you glad to see me? <laughs> oh, this is our grid. I think these might replace sunglasses sometime soon. You could just hang one of these in front of your face. So, all right, we got our image editing done. I know we're getting a lot of, out of time, and you folks really want to get into the printing process and choosing paper, which we're going to do right now. Yes. One real quick question, though, and this is, this is a good question, and it's something we do struggle with. Uh, somebody asked, they said they're a newbie, they'd like to learn a little bit more, the, the, some of the terms are unfamiliar, and yeah, it's, it's tough striking a balance when you've got such a large audience from beginners to experienced folks. So, two things. One, that's the reason we record this, yeah. so that you can just rewatch the parts that apply to you a little slower and take notes. And secondly, why we're going to have all these follow-up sessions, so that we can then take the time to dig in. Because this is a really big subject. We really didn't realize how big this subject was when we started. Yeah, and we'll do other webinars together, too, uh, For regarding sure. this. So regarding that question. Um, oh, more, more importantly, what is your feather number? Oh, my feather number <laughs> is two. Two to four, sometimes 16, but two yeah, to four. Yeah, so the question was, uh, somebody asked what, what kind of feather number Eddie uses when doing selections and, uh, and two to four. So, printing. Our images are ready for printing. In fact, yeah, we, we actually mounted a couple of our prints here. Uh, this is the image that, uh, that I just edited. Oops, let me get it out of the glare of hope. We just printed these on our, uh, our printer. And we've got one of Eddie's image edits right there. And they just came out spot on to what we saw on the screen. Totally spot Because on. we had a calibrated system. So, we're ready to print. First of all, choosing a paper. Big consideration. And we've been using the Ilford Gallery papers, but Eddie really turned me on to a specific paper that I was not familiar with. And Eddie, tell us about that. Well, that's the Ilford Gallery Gold Silk, Fiber Silk. Gold Fiber, which you have right here. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, there, there's gold in this paper, and it's just beautiful paper. The dynamic um, tonal values, the brilliant color, the sharpness. When I saw the first print coming off on this paper, I was delighted to see my image look so right on. It's beautiful. Yeah, it just I just, came alive. after Eddie uh, showed me about this paper, I just tried it as well. And one of the impressive things I felt about it was not only how smooth it was, uh, but the weight of the paper and oh. the feel of the paper. Yes. 
the weight itself. It feels like fiber-based paper, and it is, of course. It really is. For those of you that are photographic folks with the conventional darkroom, this paper actually feels like photographic paper. You're it's got the it. same kind of fiber base. Um, along with that, its weight protects the print. How many times have you guys printed, say, a big print, and maybe it fell out of the printer or got folded a little bit, and what happens? You got a little ding half moon on yeah, it. Yeah, I always thought of it as a fingernail. Eddie says half moon. I like that. Um, but this gold fiber silk paper uh, has that similar structure to, to fiber photographic paper. It's nice and heavy. And also, this weight and gamut, what are the advantages of that? the gamut range of this paper. Oh, well, your, your quality of transition between a specter highlight and diffuse shadow, that transition, a tonal gamut, is just beautiful. Yeah, absolutely it's, unbelievable. And the detail in the blacks is, is a wonderful. Now, it's exciting. I'm also a big fan of the pearl papers. Uh, the pearl papers are kind of a halfway in between a matte and a gloss. They still kind of have that brilliance of a gloss but they don't present the problems that sometimes a gloss can happen when you put that behind glass. And what happens there when the print comes off the printer? That's a good point. So what are we going to do with our print after it comes out of the printer? Well, the first thing we need to do is nothing. <laughs> well, we just need to let it cure. Yes. Uh, you got to understand that, you know, we're putting liquid ink down on these prints and it's going to evaporate and the print needs to it just needs to cure. It cure. needs to harden and dry, dry up, so to speak. Eddie cures all his prints with his hams uh, at his <laughs> home in Atlanta. Uh, but really what's going on is there's evaporation. There's outgassing going on as this print sits. And if you put it behind glass too soon, it could. Yeah, it's going to fog the inside of the glass. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's not a good thing. So we also wanted to delve down a little bit deeper by having that custom profile and be able to deal with something else called rendering intents. Yes. And there's two types of rendering intents that we might use, and that would be perceptual and relative color and metric. Relative color metric. So if, if rendering intent's new to you, then take a look at what you're going to see. Joe, you describe rendering intents better than anybody I know. Oh, thank and you. So for those of you that don't know what rendering intents are, and for those of you that do know, I think you're really going to enjoy this next Yeah, segment. it's easier seen than described, but the short answer is, as, as you watch this quick demo, is a rendering intent takes the colors that our camera captured that are way out here that can actually be printed. This happens when you go from the color space that your file's in, ProPhoto RGB, sRGB, and you convert it over to the printer profile. That's when these rendering intents take place. And that's going to allow this beautiful paper to produce the most perfect print. So let's take a look at rendering intents and then we'll come back and evaluate these prints. All right, let's discuss rendering intents and see where they come into play when we're going to be dealing with our image edits and actually doing a soft proof with our profile. So let's discuss what they are first. What rendering intents do is they deal with colors out of gamut. Well, what is out of gamut means? It means colors in your image that your printer paper combination just isn't capable of printing. Uh, frequently you'll run into a color that your camera can capture that the ink set and the paper isn't going to be able to faithfully reproduce. Maybe it's a saturation issue, maybe it's a, a depth issue. So rendering intent is going to take those colors and fix those, put them back into a printable area. Now there's two choices for photographers, relative color metric and perceptual. So let's take a look at relative color metric rendering first. Now what it does is it takes those colors that are out of gamut, as you see them flash here, and it's going to move them back into a printable space. Any of the colors that are already in a printable space will stay right where they are. So as we see here, we've got our colors randomly outside of the printable space, and when the relative color metric rendering intent is applied, those colors are all moved into a printable space into an appropriate area. Now there are pros and cons to this for relative color metric. The pros are, first of all, you're not going to have any overall tonal shift in the image from those colors moving. Also, if you just have a little bit of color out of gamut, it's a good choice. It's going to cause the least change to the image. The downside, however, especially if you have a lot of color out of gamut, since you're moving colors into a space and not moving the other colors that were already there, you can change the relationship between these colors. And that can end up sometimes in your fine gradations causing some banding and you can get some strange artifacts. 
Now the other rendering intent that we'll be using is perceptual. Now perceptual rendering does the same thing. It's going to take those same out of gamut colors and it's going to put them back in. The difference is the colors that are in gamut are going to move to adapt to them. So here we see perceptual. Now we've got those same colors out of gamut, but in addition to them being moved into a printable space, colors that were in their way then get moved. This keeps the relationship between the previously out of gamut colors and the in gamut colors the same. Now the advantage to that is you do get a much more natural color rendition if you've got a large amount of color out of gamut. However, just having a couple of pixels out of gamut can cause an overall tonal shift in the image. And we're going to see this when we actually go in soft proof. In fact, let's go into Photoshop and take a look at that. So here's one of my images that has always caused me trouble on certain types of papers. So let's take a look at the soft proofing process. And to get there, we go to View, Proof Setup, Custom. Now I've already dialed in my paper. I've got the Ilford Gold Fiber Silk, and we, I did an 800 patch custom profile using the i1 uh, Pro 2. And here we see relative colorimetric rendering. Let me kind of try to get this out of the way as much as possible. Now watch what happens when I switch from relative colorimetric to perceptual. And by the way, you want to ignore saturation and absolute. So when we go to perceptual, you can see there's an overall tonal range change in the image. So we go back to relative colorimetric, and we can see the image is a little lighter. Now some of this is subjective. You might just decide, well, I like one over the other. But to make a little more informed decision, let's see what's going on with the image. And what we're going to do is check to see uh, the gamut warning. Now I can just hit OK, leave this on relative color metric. And if we go up to view, you see the proof colors box is checked. That means we are currently looking at this print through the printer profile. This is how the print is going to print on that particular paper. What I want to also turn on is the gamut warning. And you see all of a sudden now in the middle of the boat, let me zoom in on here, I've got this green patch that showed up. Now by the way, the default gamut warning in Photoshop is actually kind of a gray. And what you can do is go under Preferences, Transparency, and Gamut and change it. Uh, the, again, the default is something around here. I favor the kind of lime green look because it's easier to find. So I'll just hit OK. Now typically when you've got a color out of gamut, and let's just hide and see what the colors are. So we've got this kind of deep red and also some of this kind of neon red and some of the real highlights here that the paper's having trouble with. So what I want to do is see if I can take control of this myself. And I'm mostly concerned about the red. The little bright highlights don't concern me. And it's okay to leave a little bit of these colors out of gamut. What I'm going to do is bring up a hue and saturation adjustment layer. And typically the first thing to check is to just lighten it up a little bit. Now if I just lighten this up a little bit, let's see as I adjust the lightness, notice just by bringing it up just a couple of points, the green gamut warning starts to disappear. And again, like I said, I don't necessarily want to get rid of all of it. So let me, and that's okay. I, again, these really bright, super bright colors here, it's okay to leave them where they are. So again, here's our whole image. Let me turn off the gamut warning. And let me turn on and off this adjustment layer and see what it's done to the image. And you can see it's in a very subtle change, but it's brought all the colors into gamut. Now the advantage is now that's exactly how that's going to print. So again, let's go to the view proof setup, custom, relative color metric, and perceptual. And let's see the difference. Now perceptual put a little bit of the depth back in this case. So let's hit OK and look at the gamut warning again. And again, we have just the same little bit of result. And I like what the adjustment layers have done to this image. Now I have an image that all the colors are in gamut, and that's what's going to print. All right, we're getting close to the end. We want to talk about evaluating our print. But first, a couple really quick questions. By the way, someone told us that the dings are called pigeons. I never heard that before. So Eddie's going to stick with half moons. I think I'm going to adopt pigeons. I kind of like that. Uh, well, one question we didn't talk about is we've got our print out. How long do we let it sit? When it comes off the printer and the cure time, 24 hours is, a, is the recommended time to harden the inks. And yeah, let gas. it completely outgas. And one thing you can do to make that speed up, and, and again, I know when all you guys buy paper, 
you immediately read the little instruction sheet that comes in the box, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, but if you were to read it, uh, it does say let it sit for 24 hours. And something else you can do is actually put a plain sheet of just like regular copier paper uh, to let it help out wick out the, uh, the moisture out of the ink. Because if you don't, you're going to get that fog and you don't want to deal with that. No. Um, let's see. Oh, a couple of you asking about Capture One. Uh, kind of a subject of its own, but I did want to address it because that is in planning stages right now. So for those of you that are using Capture One, be it with, Nikon, with Canon or medium format backs, we are going to do a program on Capture One. So stay tuned. We will let you know about that. Um, printing using 16-bit versus 8-bit. Okay, so Profoto RGB and 16-bit, if you're doing your own printing, is the way to go. Yeah, so you leave it in 16-bit. If your Lightroom, it's in 16-bit. If your printer supports it, there is a button that says print in 16-bit. By all means, do it. If you're working in ACR, you want to set the ACR um, preferences up to be in Profoto in 16-bit, by the way. So that would be an important Now, issue. if you're sending out to your lab, you want to be in sRGB in 8-bit. 8-bit, so that's, that's the short answer to that. But good questions. Thank you for that. Um, all right, a couple of you are asking real detailed stuff about pigment versus dye inks. Uh, historically, pigment inks lasted a lot longer. Uh, dye inks maybe had a little bit of an edge on intensity. And quickness of printing, but yeah. uh, light fastness is the big thing today, especially yeah. with gallery quality prints. We want to make sure. So a pigment ink is going to be more resistant to UV. Yes. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to resist fading more. So you might see these numbers for the numbers, how long the print's going to last, and they say, oh, this paper is a 100-year archival. Well, no, it's not a 100-year archival if you take the print and leave it on the dashboard of your car in August on a sunny day. That's under normal viewing conditions. So if you've got light shining on a print, yeah, pigment ink is going to be better, which brings us to another point. Light shining on a print. Light shining on a print. Now, again, this is a subject that does need to be dealt with in a little more detail. But we're talking about, well, we've got, our, we've got these beautiful prints. Oh, and uh, by the way, someone asked about when Eddie printed his print, uh, is this Ilford Gold Fiber Silk glossy paper or matte or some other surface? It does come in the one surface, and it is? Semi-gloss. Yeah, so it's got a little bit of a gloss to it, but not enough. You can see if I angle it and I get right with one of the lights reflecting back to you. But you can even see it's not a real specular light. So just keeping it out of the direct light is fine. Now, when you're going to frame, that brings up another issue. We probably don't want to use a gloss piece of paper when it's going to go behind glass. Well, the type of glass is going to be important there, too. True. And so that's where non-glare comes in handy. And also, there's a new glass available that's for gallery. Yeah, specifically for gallery, there's a real high-end glass. And yes, this stuff's expensive, but we're talking about the best possible presentation you can get. It's called museum glass. Museum glass. And the scary thing about museum glass is you put it in front of the print, you can't even tell there's glass there. Wow. It, the transmission is almost complete, and it filters out almost 100% of UV light. So the combination of that and using a pigmented ink that print's going to last a long time. Just don't have it in direct sunlight because no color is going to be light fast if it's got direct sun. Sure. But again, the details of mounting, framing, we'll talk about laminating and spraying and putting behind frame. We'll dedicate a session just for that. Again, we're trying to do an overview uh, so that we can cover a lot of material in, in a fairly short period of time. Now, this has really just been an overview even though we went into a lot of detail, particularly on the processing part. Right. Because, again, that's a really part of a gallery quality print. As I said, we'll produce a series of sessions that will dig deeper into each of these steps. And as I also, our first follow-up will be a week from Monday, uh, May 14th. We'll send you the details in a follow-up email. Uh, and also, what we're going to cover in the future, more of the details on how to conduct the initial shoot. Uh, you guys got a little glimpse into how Eddie works, how he talks to his model, um, we, have, we had fun, it's yeah, relaxing, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are not comfortable in front of the camera. So you have to, you know, you got to tell them what you want. Absolutely, you want to make them comfortable. And one thing Eddie does that uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to steal from him also, is uh, a very clear command. You might have heard him say a couple of times during the shoot, 
move your nose towards the light. <laughs> and I'm always saying to people, all right, follow my finger with your nose. I think yours is a lot more succinct and easier to understand. Well, come to the light is my motto. Come to the light. Okay, <laughs> so move your nose to the light. Uh, we'll go into even more details of image editing. And as I said, a lot more details on printing and framing and presentation because and even what kind of lights are going to be illuminating the print Ooh. is going to have an effect. Yes. Because uh, if you're using, say, a fluorescent tube, you know, what are the dangers there? Oh, the fluorescent is going to give you what, a green cast? It's going it's to have that little green spike in it. Right. It's going to kill the reds and magentas. So you can actually create a profile to compensate for that type of light. Yes, and that's one of the beauties of the i1 profiler software that we will dig into. We will take our Ilford gold fiber silk paper, we'll create a custom profile for it, and then we'll decide specifically what light source is going to illuminate this print. And then from that, we can actually adjust the profile so that when it comes out of the printer, it's already got the color adjustments in it to counteract what effect that light is going to have on this print so it still looks perfectly daylight to us, even if there's some odd light illuminating the print. So can I take a profile that I've created here and save it and readjust it out for another type of lighting? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, once you've got a profile, if you go back into the i1 profiler software, you can then tell it, I'm now looking, the default is daylight, by the way, 5000K. Yes. Uh, but if I all of a sudden say, well, this print is going to be illuminated by tungsten lights, I can adjust the profile and it will counteract that. Awesome. So again, wow, we're way out of time. Eddie, before we go, any final words of advice? I just, uh, I just want to say it's all about the light. That was succinct and profound at the same time. <laughs> all right. So what we're going to do. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to thank Eddie. Joe, thank you. For what coming a, a out to Atlanta to be with us today. Let's do this again. Look forward Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to end with our slideshow that we showed before with the images of Hope uh, that were shot right out of the camera. We will be sending out a follow-up email, as will Eddie, and we'll let you know what's coming up and in the near future, including the uploaded True HD version of this broadcast. Uh, you'll also receive from Eddie some information on some hands-on location workshops that Eddie's got planned, uh, including where we're working on one uh, in Savannah in September where we're trying to nail down right now. Yeah. Something definitely to be taken advantage of. So until next time, we're going to leave you with the images. By the way, we'll hang out. So after the slideshow, we will stay here and we'll answer some more of your questions for those of you that want to continue to, uh, to visit with us. Thanks to our sponsors so much, Ilford, uh, for the phenomenal papers, and x Right for our color workflow. And thanks again also to Triple Scoop Music for the great soundtracks. And, of course, thanks again to Eddie Tapp. So, you, until next time, be well and keep shooting. And for those of you that want, we'll be back here for questions. Enjoy the show.